believe the people of the we also believe the people of the United States and the world would be better served if the budgets of the United States defense and state departments were flipped. The US currently spends approximately $750 billion on war and $33 billion only on diplomacy. Thank you for everyone who has joined us and thank you especially to all who have donated. Your donations will sustain the work of Colo and the North Texas Peace Advocates. Please consider donating if you haven't done so already. We will be grateful for any help. You can go to your event bright page and there's a place where you can uh, make a, a, a donation of 10, 20, 50, $100 uh, or whatever uh, you, can, you, can, uh, you can afford. Um, please look us up on Facebook and like our page and like us. Uh, this will uh, uh, make sure that you continue to get notices from us about our future webinars. This month's spotlight will take a close look at recent developments in the Balkans where tensions have been simmering for 25 years and are now escalating to dangerous levels. We have a great panel uh, that we have gathered for you tonight. Belma Islamovic, a survivor of the war in Bosnia three decades ago. Dr. Danisa Anderson, founder of Kolo, uh, that does humanitarian work uh, in Bosnia, and she'll be talking about her work when she, she gets on. And Dr. Randall Puljek Shank, a peace activist and scholar based in Sar Sarajevo. Each panelist will have approximately 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, hopefully, you will have time to have a QA session uh, at the end. Let me set up the program for you. Um, uh, 25 years after the Bosnia War ended with the signing of the Dayton Peace Accords. Bosnia is facing a political crisis that some fear could lead to armed conflict and a repetition of the horrendous and horrific events of the mid 90s. Uh, Milorad Dodik, the Serb member of Bosnia's tripartite presidency announced recently that the country's Serb run entity will quit key state institutions to achieve full autonomy within the country. This is in complete violation of the 1995 peace accord. Uh, Milorad Dodik has also threatened uh, secession of Republika Spriska from Bosnia for the past 15 years. And his latest statement have fueled concerns that an armed conflict could be reignited. The current crisis erupted in the aftermath of a new law that banned genocide denial and glorification of war criminals from the, from the conflict in, 19, in the mid 1990s. Now, Dadek insists this isn't secession. There is no possibility for war. But he told media on October 14th that seven European countries support Bosnia's resolution, adding that friends, quote, friends have promised him help in case of. Western military intervention. Based on Dodik's comments, is secession really, really in the cards? Some of you will be surprised to hear that several nations have their national interests in the region, namely Russia, China, Iran, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and even the United Arab Emirates. In tonight's webinar, we will explore the underlying issues that have festered for 25 years and what we as ordinary Americans can do to bear upon the Biden administration to protect and uphold the peace agreement the Clinton administration brokered between the Bosniaks, the Serbs, and the Croats in 1996. Um, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Um, she is Belma Islamovic. Um, she lives here in Dallas with us, but she was born in Mostar, Bosnia. She lost both arms when a Croatian mortar struck her family home. Um, her story is featured in an upcoming documentary, Forgiving the Unforgivable, the Tragedy of War and the Power of Forgiveness, which will be broadcast on Dallas uh, PBS station KERA 90.1 FM uh, on December 30th. Velma is a motivational speaker. Please contact us if you would like to hear uh, if you'd like to uh, have her speak to your church, your high school, or your university class. 
It is my pleasure and my honor to introduce to you uh, uh, Belma Islamovic, who will talk about her experiences uh, in the mid 90s uh, in, 90, uh, in, in Bosnia, what happened and her journey and where she is, where she is right now, emotionally, mentally, with the suffering that she and fellow Bosnians went through. Hello, everybody. My name is Belma Islamovic. And like the, my brother Hadi say, I am from the Bosnia Herzegovina city Mostar. I was born there and raised for uh, almost 20 years. Uh, I was planning like to be growing up, like every girl having the dream. And my dream was to come be like a clothes designer, finish the school, get the job and have my own family. But suddenly war came with the Serbia guys, uh, or Serbian people actually, 1992. And then when we kicked the Serbian from the Mostar, uh, 1993, we started with the Croatia too. So I lost my both times from the Croatia people when I was 19 years old, me and my middle sister sleeping in the room and the shell hit through the, the window and exploded by our behind heads. We are uh, that moment suffering and we are seeing the sm uh, sm uh, fog, uh, smoke, uh, fog of everywhere. And I heard uh, uh, feeling my pain on my arms and they took me to the hospital. Doctor say, uh, she will not survive. She will going to pass in uh, probably two hours, but it's no his decision. It was the God decision. So two of them, they say, let's try and have uh, the surgery. So they took me to the, uh, to the surgery room, do it, amputee my both arms. And I came to the United States with my mom and two sisters. My father could not come join us 1994 because he has to stay in the Bosnia because there was still the war. And uh, when we uh, come the first in America, it was the Abilene, Texas. The, that was our first home because the hospital was the sponsor, Dr. Roberta Calafur. She came, her roots came from the former Yugoslavia. And so she asked hospital, can they uh, help her to bring somebody who was injured from the Bosnia? And they tell her definitely, why not? And so sh she showed them the list. And the li when she showed them the list, uh, they asked her, who are you going to choose? This is the list was so huge. She said, I have idea. And she, they asked her what kind of, so, she said, I have, uh, I'm going to drop the pen and whichever name pen fell, I'm going to br brought that person. So she dropped the pen and pen fell on my name. That's how me and my mom and my two sisters came to the United States. My father joined us 1996 for six months. And then later on, he came 1998 for good, stay with us. It took me a really long time to suffer with uh, losing my both arms. I was in the depression. Uh, I was uh, didn't want to be alive. Uh, I just wanted, if I, I told my parents when I found it, I told them that I want to even die, that I don't want to live anymore. But God is the one uh, who, who keep, kept me in alive and he knows uh, that uh, I'm going to do something. So one day when I start walking up in the hospital, I told my friend, uh, I am not the only one who lost something. There is so many people that they are missing even the leg or arms or the eye. And if I go somewhere, I will uh, uh, tell the people what happened to the Bosnia and what was the war because the war, it was not really good because so many people get killed. Some of them, they go to the concentration camp and so many women get raped. I mean, I, I don't want to have that happen that again to the, my country. I'm asking to people the please stop because we, that we do not have to beg uh, 
uh, again for those help uh, uh, help us and um, that we go through what we did in the back 90s uh, to and 93 and 94 and 95. So please uh, uh, do not allow them uh, to uh, the start the war again. And one more thing, uh, like how did you say, mention it, that I have now my uh, documentary about me. It's Forgive the Unforgivable. I finally decided that I'm going to say my story. And there are like uh, two reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to uh, talk about the war. What was the war that was not good? And uh, those who want the war, that there are uh, some in politics, bigger one, they will not be on the land uh, protecting. They will be hiding somewhere. The human people, they are going to uh, fight from, uh, for, for, for something what was not good. And the second thing, why will I love to share my story? Because all the time when uh, people ask my, uh, uh, when they hear my accent, uh, they will ask me, where are you from? And I will tell them from the Bosnia and Herzegovina. And they will tell me, or oh, you lost you both times from the Serbs. And I will uh, tell them, uh, I will have to tell them, no, I lost them from the Croatia. And so that is the second reason that I want to share because I don't want to, that, that nobody like know that the Croatia did the war in the Bosnia because our country is called Bosnia and Herzegovina. So Serbia wanted to have the Bosnia, but Croatia want to have Herzegovina. And hoping and praying that the uh, going to be the peace and people live their normal lives. Thank you so much. Thank you, Belma. Thank you for uh, telling your story again. I know um, it's not easy for you, but uh, we really appreciate you, uh, uh, you talking about this. And I'm gonna ask uh, Valley uh, or Nick, either one of them uh, who can, um, show um, the brief trailer that we have, like a two minute, three minute trailer of your documentary um, uh, to, to all who are on the call. That moment when they told me that uh, that happened to me, I told them, my life is over. Don't even, uh, I don't want anymore to leave. Uh, I don't want anymore to go out. Uh, I just want to uh, stay in the ho home, in the room, and I don't want anybody to see it. She did nothing but lie on the sofa all day long. She was in a severe, deep, dark depression. And one day I said to her, what's the change this year? Why is it that you now say you're willing to forgive people and you want to tell your story. It was then that she discovered this phrase. 
the God told me that I'm a good person, that I have a good soul, you will go, going to one day show up and you will be much happy that I'm going to the, forgive my enemy, whatever he did, that he did destroy my life, uh, no problem, I for, forgive him. It's unusual that people have so many different chances to recreate a new life. Only through tragedy can one undergo this spiritual rebirth I start noticing the changes, and those changes I like a lot, because I like to see my sister smiling, I like to see my sister moving forward, I like to see my sister be very happy. She burst out of her shell and she became more energetic. She decided to go back to school, she decided to start volunteering and doing a lot of different activities through the community, including our Bosnian community as well. She's looking like the young woman that she was when she lived back in Mostar, before the war hit her city. This is exciting. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Finally, I got what I was praying for. <laughs> she waited for this long time. I know that for sure. I can tell because we are very close friends, and I think she's very happy. Thank you for that, Valley. Even though uh, we had a few glitches, but we were we were able to pull it off. Uh, uh, I think everybody got a sense of what uh, the documentary about. It's a beautiful, powerful story of uh, uh, Belma's life and uh, where she was and where she is today is just absolutely remarkable and miraculous uh, to many of us who know her. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, ask, I'm going to move, uh, we're going to move on to the uh, next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Denisa Anderson. She's the founder of COLO, K-O-L-O, -O, Women's Cross-Cultural Collaboration. Her in-depth work includes uh, Bosnian women survivors, uh, uh, women like, uh, like Belma. Uh, she has made two tours of Afghanistan. She is uh, uh, doing amazing work in, in that part of the world and as a social victim gender expert with the International Criminal Court. Uh, uh, Dr. Denisa Anderson, will you please uh, give us a uh, understanding of uh, uh, what happened in Bosnia in the mid nineties uh, and what is at stake today and what needs to happen to prevent uh, a repeat of this, uh, of this horrendous and horrific history. Sorry, uh, <laughs> um, I have over two decades of work working in trauma. And since 1997, I've been working with the Bosnian women war crimes and war survivors. Um, I would go back there, live there for a certain period of time and then come back and forth and continue on uh, with the fact of how do we heal such unforgivable trauma, and I concentrated on women. I also, uh, as a clinical psychologist, um, I am also uh, do a lot of research and scientific work um, in, in regards to violence and how do we have peace. I just want to add to Belma, uh, where I work is in Travnik, uh, in Novi Travnik, and also um, in Travnik in Amica Vitez. And Amica Vitez is a site of war crimes that was committed by the Croatian um, um, Ustasha, which is kind of like a terrorist group or what have you. So everybody asks me when I talk about Amica Vitez and my clinical work, um, in trauma there, they asked me, well, was it the Serbs? But in that part of the country, um, 
It was more so with the Croats than it was with the Serbians. They were actually more friends with the Serbians when that uh, war broke out. And in fact, before the war broke out, the Serbians um, that lived there sold everything and left and, and warned their Muslim friends to get out because they said, you've got to remember World War II. So I found it really interesting that most uh, Western people uh, don't really have that history or that knowledge of what kind of influence in towards war and then for peacemaking that needs to involve the Croat, uh, Croat Republic as much as possible as well, because they, they have a very painful, violent past. And, you know, they're also players on the keyboard, Velma. So I understand when you were saying that, I have to tell people it was the Croatians, not the Serbs, you know. Um, I think it was very, it's very difficult for most people to understand about the Balkan War and how they put it in as an ethnic thing. I also need to tell you that my mother survived a World War II uh, concentration camp, Yasnovac, and her family, or my family, my maternal family, and her sister are in the war, uh, war crimes archives, um, which I just found out about that in 2019 when I hosted a women's trauma conference in Sarajevo. And I was interviewed by Al Jazeera. And they said, did you know that your mother is on the archives for being a part of this camp? Um, it really does explain a little more of my background because I tend to be in areas and countries that are just devastated um, or have war crimes and violent acts of crimes. And it also pinpoints why I tend to focus on the women. And so what I'm going to be talking about tonight is about my work with refugees and on the Balkan route. That does include, just like Hadi was talking about, um, from Africa, Middle East, Afghanistan, Pakistan, all the way up through the Ukraine now. We have Ukraine issue with Belarus, and then we also have it with Poland. Uh, Poland has the Belarus, and then the Ukrainians have Russia also moving in there. Um, most people don't realize or recognize that even with Turkey and all of that kind of crescent Balkan route, uh, that it involves a lot of other actors, and, and they just never really include that. So I don't know where Valley is with my PowerPoint, but can you start that, uh, Valley? Is she there? <laughs> I don't know if she's there. I titled my work, you know, uh, or this PowerPoint, like portraying the real scenario, the Balkan Roots Women Refugees. Uh, the main reason why I do it is because of my clinical trauma research and work. And, um, my application of an informed trauma care. Um, it's important because if the women can heal their own trauma, they actually give peace and harmony to the community. You don't have the war. Um, Want to go to the next one? Or can you just do it as a slideshow? That might be better because it's kind of confusing. Do you know how to do that? At the top, you have a slideshow. Mm -hmm. Not there. No, no. Second down, down a little bit. You see the slide? No. Over. Not comments. You got file, home, insert, draw, design, transitions, animation, slide show. Oh, you're going up there. Up. Yeah, it's hard for me to see with the videos. Uh, screen. Okay. All right, well, we'll just leave it on, on this one. So when we look at the Balkan route, and um, what I learned from these women war crimes and war survivors in Bosna, um, I looked at the trauma issues as something that is neglected in peace uh, efforts and policies and also humanitarian um, aid agencies in terms of their mandates and how they're going to take care of the situation. Wonderful, Valley, thank you. Um, We'll stay on this a little bit. So 
What happened for me in my research in all these years, and also with the International Criminal Court, where I did most of the work in Sub-Sahara Africa, and in Afghanistan, I was with the Department of Defense, um, right on the front lines, and working with both um, Taliban and the Allies and uh, Pakistan and all the other actors involved in that. Um, but I also was in Sri Lanka um, with their civil war, and I was also in India and Haiti in the, after the 2010 earthquake. So I, I have a very global perspective. And there again, I would always look at the women and see how I can get a, com a communal and a community there where we can start healing at the local level. However, in doing my research and my trauma-informed care, the main challenge was is that it didn't really identify women. And for instance, they'll say civilian casualties. But of that, I don't know how many were women or children for that. And that just started to be registered in the last maybe 10, 12 years. But even now, they're in these very uh, um, neutered categories. And even though I hit some of these institutionalized stakeholders research and data, uh, they were all skewed for their own profit making, even if they were a nonprofit, or even if they were a government, or even if they were the UN. It was just, you know, I had to sort all that out. But I was able to discover that what's really missing first is the women's trauma narratives that are issues, their stories, just like Belmont. That's gone unless they're in a victim role. And yet those are the very individuals that we have to learn from and how to carve out a very peaceful uh, way of life with each other. And number two, it was really significant. It's their need for a safe place. If we give women a safe place, even if they're refugees, even if they're uh, you know, victims of war and what have you. And the safe place is really engineered there. It just involves into a place where there is peace and then everyone works together. Can I have the next um, slide? Allie, can you move over? Thank you. Uh, what's happening now, um, especially in Bosnia, and why we're having this uh, seminar is really important because um, I predicted there was going to be war as early as 1998 again. Uh, we had a lot of mafia within, you know, uh, the former Yugoslav countries, and um, it's, it's everywhere. Every time you have a war, you have a lot of this mafia or black market and what have you. Um, but Let's just look, uh, currently in Bosnia, you've got a growing genocide and fascist environment. And they hook into a lot of the refugees' life experiences uh, and their need for support and uh, their need for safety, health, and well-being, right? And you don't hear much about their narratives in terms of that, but you will hear about them sensationalizing how horrific it is, um, and basically, when they sensationalize it, they sexualize this whole violence type of thing for the refugees. But when you see this map, do you see how many countries are involved? And, and, and you can see how close even Poland is. We, I should have added in um, the Ukraine. So you can see how some of the actors are Russia. They're also Turkey. They're also um we have refugees from Yemen. We have refugees from even Libya. And we have refugees uh, from Afghanistan that, that has been there since 2012, at least. And uh, it continues to grow. And uh, this becomes a narrative or an environment where we have a lot of fascist or autocratic countries and, um, you know, countries that are, you know, not democratic, that are really hooking into this kind of scenario and, and, and hoping for more and more chaos. Can we have the next slide? Um, below is a picture I took of the Amitav Vitez uh, uh, mosque that was destroyed 
Detroit where there was a site of war crimes, that entire village was wiped out. Um, they were Muslim, but right across the one lane highway is a Croatian community. And the Croats there, uh, along with the Croatian army, they marked all the doors um, across the, the street where the Muslims left with the red sign. And they were murdered uh, during their early call to prayer the next morning, right? So this Croatian community was living side by side with this Muslim community. And overnight, it was a site of war crime. So we need to really have some kind of clinical informed trauma therapies that really have women at the center so that we can have a discovery of facts so that we can have women at the negotiating tables for peace at the negotiating tables for you know war crimes and and what have you but you don't um and then also the refugee groups whether they're female male or children or whatever gender they um have no voice. They're just refugees. They're an other group. But if we start to add that in, you've got the missing um, international relations data and trust for security, global security, counterterrorism, and terrorism as well. But then you will allow these refugees, women refugees especially, they started to heal their own collective trauma. And in this picture below is the group of women from that live about 20 minutes away from Amish of Vitas, the site of war crimes. Um, these women I worked with for over two decades. When I first started working with them, they really had nothing. And so I would bring people over and um, they would stay there and all they knew how to do was bed and breakfast and they didn't understand how they could make money. And they became the only, only individuals in that town that brought money into a war-torn community. And they became worthy, I guess. And, but what happened is, is that the community grew and interacted with the Croatian community within the town of Novi Tavnik. And peace was had in a town which was ripped apart during the Balkan War. All right, so can we go to the next slide? So with this, you know, invaluable resources that are neglected for peace, we need to look at some of the basics, if you want safety, we do know that women are more, they have more tools to be socially engaged, right? And it doesn't matter if it's in uh, Bosnia Herzegovina or if it's in um, Sri Lanka or Afghanistan. I just understood that they actually um, have the social skills to bring about at the grassroots level, at the very local level, the community that's needed uh, to be, you know, in harmony, in harmony with each other. And um, once we got past a lot of the, uh, you know, categories that excluded women and started to include them, there's bonding, there's social engagement, and there's social and collectives. This is where a lot of information is gathered. A lot of what I call preventative steps occur, not interventions. Because interventions happen after the violence, after the shooting, after the killing. This is preventative. When you bond with each other and when you have social engagement, you know that something is afoot and you can step in to take care of this, right? At the local level, if we can, what better than the women at the local level there? Um, however, what they have now at the local level, uh, not as much in Novi Kravnik, but they, uh, they have domestic violence, um, which is also non-state torture and conflict because a lot of the men don't have jobs. The economy is really bad. And um, they have all these war, you know, survival things in the men, and they actually are quite violent. But once I had the women, the group of women I worked with in Novi Sopnik, they're the ones that brought the money in, and they didn't just keep it for their own families, they spread it around the whole town, um, which was really interesting. And it really brought domestic violence down to a, such a low level, it was just incredible. But here are some of the recent headlines concerning that Balkan route in Bosnia. We've got uh, 
about the Acerb separates and uh, who is also egged on by the puppet master Putin. And along with four years of uh, former President Trump that it really allowed a lot of these um, Serb separatists and um, I don't know, I, I, I can't even say a common word, but uh, that are really uh, igniting amid the chaos of all these refugees from Syria, mm -hmm. Afghanistan, Middle East, Yemen even, uh, that are coming through this Balkan uh, route and trying to get to Germany actually, but they pass through Serbia, uh, not so much Bosnia, but they will go through Bosnia to go to Croatia at the Una River Point, which Valley will speak about and what she encountered there. Uh, but uh, I just think we have to look at what's happening there. So, for instance, at Sabanitsa, over 8,300 people were massacred. Well, actually, there were mostly male relatives, and I've been there. And it's just, just in comprehensible to anybody. Um, this is a picture of uh, a woman who lost her husband and teenage son in, during the Balkan War. Can we go to the next uh, slide? I hope I'm not going to take too long. We might have to go through faster. So I did this kind of uh, comparison with the Balkan root refugees, which mean it's Syrian, Afghan, I mean, a whole mixture of women, right? they're really deciding that they can't stay where they're at because, you know, death was intimate. Of course, even if they go on the Balkan route, there is most likely death, but they were seeking um, thriving skills. They had the right decision-making to be able to have a clear, decisive Yes, we're going to go on this route because of the two. We cannot stay here, but we have to be on the move, which I, I, I find, in other words, they weren't just operating from a trauma headspace. With trauma, you're always surviving. They're actually looking at it in terms of a flourishing or thriving skill. And when they're on the route, you will see these refugees actually bond together with certain other families. I mean, it's almost like a procession. And, and they actually create a safe place for themselves and their family. Um, seeking safety is an epigenetic tool, right? So epigenetic is something that um, we are shaped by the environment and we can actually shape the environment. It goes back and forth. How you live life daily is also going to be lived out by future generations. And after so many generations, it becomes genetic. But while you're shaping everything, it becomes epigenetic. And you can see these women that are bonding and looking for a safe place. It's a very epigenetic tool that actually heals trauma as well. And the epigenetic uh, definition includes the women refugee life experiences. Their narratives, they have to inform. Just like Bella, Bella's story, and I'm so glad that it's going to be out in the media because we need that. This is what will help us to have peace. And it allows these women, these, they're no longer victims. They're no longer survivors. They are the people that we will learn from. They are authoring their own lives. And Bella was talking about how she authored her own life. It's just amazing. So in the next column, I have this growing violence. And you can start seeing all the countries involved. You've got China. I, most people don't realize. They, uh, Hadi was talking about the UAE, United uh, Emirates. People don't realize that that's a very dark entity and has been involved with a lot of Afghanistan, um, a lot of the Middle East woes. Um, it, it's just something that we have to watch out for. But the flow of refugees are all coming up through Europe, right? So trauma will show up in emotional upheavals. You've got the COVID pandemic now, the last two years, domestic violence, and they all have the pattern of isolation or being the other group, removal from society. They don't have the ability to have social engagement with the local communities. Um, they also have withdrawal and they're silenced. 
or even silenced in the policies or at the peace negotiating tables or in government entities. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, Dr. Denisa, if you could uh, 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 summarize uh, your presentation in for in the next uh, two minutes, we would like uh, to. Uh, okay, I Valley was going to say something too. Uh, maybe we could save that for later. But uh, yeah, what we could do? Can you keep going on? Let's, I want to go to the map and I'll summarize. Uh, can you go to the next slide? Next slide. Right. So uh, that's not very clear, but at least it shows how all these other actors are involved. And, you know, sometimes you just don't know where to start. You don't know where to go. And it's a very chaotic place. But there is a place where we can start and it's with the women. If we had policies and peace on negotiating tables with the women and their narratives and their input, um, and their need for safety, I think that's the only way they get to go and do peace. So I'll finish it right there. And I think the PowerPoint can be made available for everybody if they wanted to go through that. Valley, did you want to just add in a little bit about what you saw when you were in the Una um, River in, uh, on the border of Bosnia and uh, Croatia? Yeah, I think I, I can um, share in the question and answer part, and I want to uh, respect uh, the time of our last presenter who's um, waiting in Sarajevo for his turn, so I'll, I'll, I'll wait till the end. Okay. okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Denise Anderson, for that presentation, and thank you, uh, Valley Reed. Uh, I want to introduce our uh, last speaker. Uh, it's a special privilege and honor for us to have him with us. Uh, he is staying up in Bosnia, it's uh, uh, almost uh, three o'clock in the morning in Bosnia. Uh, so, so thank you. Uh, Dr. Randall Poljic Shank is the founder of the Peace Academy and Restart Development Initiative. He holds a PhD in political science. Uh, Dr. Randall worked with the Mennonite Central Committee in Bosnia from 2002 to 2012, supporting local peace building programs, inter-religious action, and trauma healing, the same work that Dr. Denisa is doing. Uh, it is my special privilege and honor to welcome uh, Dr. Randall Puljic Shank uh, to the webinar, and hopefully he can give us some understanding of uh, what is at stake right now, what are the conditions on the ground, why is it uh, being to being said in the media that this is a crisis in in Bosnia and the Balkans right now that parallels the crisis that led to the genocide, the horrific and horrendous episodes that unfolded in the mid 1990s. I am myself personally uh, just shaken to the core that there could be a possibility, uh, a hair's possibility of returning uh, to, the, uh, to the events of the mid 90s. So please welcome uh, uh, Dr. Randall Poljic Shack. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation to be here and um, Thanks for the presentations that came before. Um, there's a lot that could be said um, that I could say about the importance of, um, of bottom-up work and, uh, and more attention to, to trauma, absolutely. Um, uh, the, the topic that I was given though, um, and that's something that I've worked at a lot, a lot over these last 20 years. The topic I was given was to provide some, some input on the, on the present uh, political situation. So I'll, I'll try and do that. Um, and I'm, I'm hesitant um, uh, when we have uh, Bosnians in the audience and we have people who know Bosnia very well, but I'm also aware that some people may not. So um, some of this may be, uh, may be a, a, bit of, a bit of review for those of you who, who know Bosnia well. Let me just say a little bit about myself um, because I, um, I, I think that um, the, the identities that I bring and, um, uh, and, uh, and the background and things are important. Um, I consider myself a Bosnian American. Uh, my wife is my wife is Bosnian and, and cool. I've cool. Uh, lived here in Sarajevo for almost 20 years um, and was here actually during the at, at the end of the last the last year of the war as well, uh, doing humanitarian work. Um, um, uh, um, the, you just heard a little bit about some, some of that work. Um, uh, uh, doing peace building, doing a, a lot of work with, with interreligious work and so on. Um, uh, then I did some research about civil society and the important question of legitimacy. So 
um, I think we need to look at Bosnia as, um, as an example of um, an international project as well uh, of, of some, some form of peace building and, and really look critically at how that has worked and legitimacy is one of the, one of the key questions there. And now I'm working uh, with an organization that works with municipal governments. Um, so I can talk a little bit about that. So let me start. Um, I think we need to provide a little bit of context. I'm going to try and do this without, um, uh, you know, giving too long of a story, but to sort of set it up for you um, a little bit. And maybe just to, to kind of jump ahead a little bit and say, um, I, I am absolutely very concerned about what's happening right now, but, um, but I, um, but my, me and my family are still here. <laughs> so um, uh, I, I, think, um, I think there are, um, for me, the most likely thing is not, not the outbreak of conflict, but that doesn't mean that it, that it couldn't happen. So um, I'll get to the explaining that, that kind of perspective in, in a moment. So let me just talk a, a little bit about the Dayton Agreement, um, uh, which was, of course, uh, a key um, uh, landmark of the um, of the Clinton administration and, and formally end the fighting, and is widely acknowledged for having ended the fighting. But um, but at the same time, uh, because it includes the present constitution, um, one that was not really set up to to enable a functioning state, uh, right? A long term a long term structure. So it was compromise, as peace agreements always are. Um, it um, uh, enabled the continuation of the Republika Srpska, which had been created during the war, um, and left many things unresolved. Um, and that's really what has contributed to, um, has provided the groundwork for, um, for this state of frozen conflict, which, which we've been having since, um, uh, since, since the Dayton Agreement, right now more than, more than 25 years. So it didn't really involve, uh, resolve fundamental issues that led to the war, right? Is Bosnia one state? Um, is it a state that is built on the right of ethnic groups? Um, or is it a civic state, right? You have both of those ideas present in the constitution um, so that ethnic groups um, have their representatives and they have some rights, but citizens also have rights. And, and this tension, I think, um, really Being comes up I'm, again and again I'm in the time the since then. Video call, but I can't get the camera to work. Sorry, someone's not on mute there, yeah. Um, so um, uh, what has, uh, again, I have to like just summarize some really key things uh, very quickly, but you know, kind of what's happened um, post date and which, which led us here, um, there was a massive rebuilding and international intervention with, uh, with the NATO troops and then now EU troops um, uh, in um, a post-war situations. Um, the second highest level of, of money was invested per capita um, of any country in the world. So there was a, there was a massive investment, um, much of it wasted, not effective um, for, for various reasons. But Bosnia is a, is a case study of um, liberal, um, liter, liberal interventionism, the idea that, um, that the West could remake countries um, and, uh, and, build, and, and build based on the idea of a liberal peace. So, uh, setting up a democracy, setting up, uh, enabling civil society and, um, and enabling capitalism, um, that these would somehow lead to peace. And I think uh, Bosnia is a convincing case that this idea was, um, was, was, was ill-advised from the beginning. Um, and of course, Afghanistan as, as, the, as the even, even stronger, um, you know, very, um, very, very negative example that we've seen um, that's going on. Um, so the Dayton Agreement set up the Peace Implementation Council, which is a group of countries, um, which are the guarantors of the P of the P of outside countries, which are the guarantors of the peace. Um, the high representative was responsible for civilian implementation and over time was given what are called the bond powers, which enabled um, the high representative to enact laws, to remove elected officials. Um, but uh, after, after a certain period, the bond powers haven't been used until, until very recently. Um, so there's been uh, an international, um, uh, an evolving international approach, um, how, in, how much uh, to be involved in, uh, in trying, to move, trying to move the peace forward. Uh, and a general sense that um, too, much, too much international intervention um, has enabled nationalist politicians to not take responsibility for their actions. So there was a step back from the bond powers. Um, and then there was a gradual strategy of addressing this ambiguity about exactly what 
what the the two parts of the of the um, Bosnia Herzegovina are: the RS and the Federation. What are their respective um, levels of competence? Uh, so gradually adding more competences to the national level, to the Bosnia Herzegovina level, uh, which were particularly an, a unified army and uh, joint taxation. Um, and and this, was, um, this was going forward until in 2006, when there was a very definite stop. Um, and really, the current period um, and the, um, um, the, uh, the kind of period of stuckness and status quo has really been most pronounced since, since 2006. Okay, so that brings us to the, the, current, uh, the current state. Um, in some way, I think what's uh, challenging about, about understanding Bosnia is that there's so many actors uh, that need to be taken into, into account. Um, so um, a, a bit of a, um, you know, maybe a metaphor of a game is, is helpful in the, in the sense that, um, you know, there's certain, um, certain rules and certain, certain um, uh, kind of actors, but there's, there's a lot of actors. So it's, um, there's many, many people going on and, and interaction of what they want and what they think of each other and what they think of, of the intentions are. Um, so um, there have been uh, several important court cases um, which, um, which pointed out that the Dayton structure uh, does not allow all citizens equal rights. That was the Sede Trinci case. Uh, in Mosta, there was an important court case which said that a compromise which had been worked out for the municipal government also doesn't treat all citizens equally. So again, going back to this question of the contradictions that, that were included in the Dayton Agreement. Milo Dodik has been mentioned, uh, and he's been a, a, a longtime presence, constantly pushing for more RS independence. And not only that, but um, periodically when elections need to happen, um, using the threat of a referendum and the threat of RS independence as a way to mobilize his voters. And I think What's going on right now absolutely needs to be seen in the context of um, elections which are coming up and planned for next year. So um, Dodik is in a relatively weak position. The opposition has been winning um, particularly local elections. And I think that um, uh, he, Dodik is a little bit like the, um, the, the boy who cried wolf, right? He said he's called for independence so many times that people don't believe him anymore. Um, and um, he needs to up the level of, of rhetoric um, in order to win his voters, um, which is really, really, I think his primary motivation is about staying in power and that of many of the nationalist politicians as well. So it's not at all about protecting their people or um, it's about protecting the money that they that they want and the benefits that they have from the present system. Um, so the triggering event for this particular uh, this particular thing, aside from what I already mentioned was uh, the outgoing high representative Valentin Insko uh, in, in force, put in put in by his bond powers uh, the law on, on uh, uh, negating genocide. Um, so this is something that had been debated in the in the Bosnian Parliament, um, but it was a quite significant uh, step to go back to these bond powers, which hadn't been used for many years, uh, in order to put this law. And that was the. The, the official reason that uh, that Dodik gave for um, for the present um, uh, the present kind of crisis on the international side we also have many actors um, the EU is very important because of the uh, official perspective of the EU as a as a um, of Bosnia as a me as a member state but the EU tends to be a, a rather um, rather unclear and indecisive actor. Um, because of um, uh, because of the nation states have their own have their own interests as well and presence, uh, so many people would wish for a much stronger and more principled EU stand. Uh, the U.S. is very important as the um, um, uh, the motor behind the Dayton Agreement and the provider of troops at the time, but the U.S. position seems quite passive at the moment. Um, so um, uh, the position of the Biden administration here, which has many veterans of, Bos of um, um, the, the 90s, uh, people who know Bosnia quite well, have spent much time here, um, seems, a bit, seems a bit muddled. And um, there, is, there is a bit of a continuation of uh, the Trump administration's very transactional approach um, and, and very much, uh, let's, let's see what kind of deal we can get from the nationalist politicians. Um, and uh, I would really agree with what uh, um, with Dr. Anderson said uh, about the um, 
you know, sort of it depends on who you who you talk to and who's at the table, right? Um, and so, if the nationalist parties are the ones at the table, um, they have their they have their particular interests, which are not really not really feathering fees. Um, Russia um, has not played a very proactive role, but certainly um, could, um, and and the potential for a destabilizing role, as as was seen in Ukraine, uh, is is relevant, and especially given what's happening in Ukraine right now. Um, and then the surprise actor a little bit is the UK has recently appointed um, uh, their own emissary, um, a military one. And there was also quite a uh, quite vigorous debate about uh, the importance of uh, supporting Bosnian institutions in the in the UK Parliament. Um, so um, uh, so that was um, uh, that that's that has I think some interesting potential to to change things. Um, uh, and uh, and part of what we've seen recently is uh, actors like the US. All of these actors have envoys, and there have been meetings, and everything is going on. Um, but have are really are taking an, uh, an attitude of trying to create a deal on the election law, uh, which is something that the Croat Nationalist Party, the HDZ, really wants. Um, basically, because what they were trying to do is, is uh, to create an election law that would guarantee them uh, continuing to win elections, which is, isn't a very democratic, <laughs> very democratic uh, principle, but gets back to the, 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 the role of ethnic groups in the, in the state. Um, and so um, our actors like the United States have been um, demonstrably, I mean, this is not public, but, uh, but it's, it's come out, have been putting pressure on, on the liberal parties, right? So um, the parties that, that want um, a civic state um, and want individual rights um, have been putting, uh, have been receiving pressure to accept a, it's a kind of a bad deal. And, um, and there, I think it seems like that, that the, the pro, what they call the pro Bosnian bloc uh, seems seems fairly united, and actually, um, they really have enough votes to prevent any kind of any kind of bad deal from being adopted in the in the um, the Bosnian parliament. So, um, Dr. Randall, if I may ask you a question yes. at this point, um, sure. Uh, political problems, and there is no doubt in my mind uh, that what uh, Bosnia Herzegovina is is going through right now is a political crisis. Uh, yes. But political crises are usually uh, brought about by economic uh, consideration or economic mm. issues. Uh, how much of the current turmoil would you attribute to the lack of economic support uh, that the U.S. Uh, and, and, and the uh, European Union promised uh, uh, when the Dayton Accords were signed? Uh, particularly uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, the uh, aspiration uh, of this region uh, to join uh, the uh, join NATO, for example. Uh, how much of that, how much is the economic situation playing into the, uh, the current uh, turmoil? And, and most importantly, I think this is the reason for this webinar, uh, is uh, not to just sit around and, and get smart about the issue, but what can we do as American citizens to effectuate or bring about, or if I call up my member of Congress or my Senator tomorrow morning, what should I be telling them? Mm. Yeah, thanks. Um, both uh, two, two really good, good questions. Um, absolutely, economic issues are very important. Um, and, and I think a contributing factor to this crisis is, um, I mean, there's been lots of assistance, but, um, the, the potential for any of the of, of the remaining uh, former Yugoslav states to join the EU seems very unlikely at this point, especially Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, and that absolutely affects. Um, so it's not just about economic aid, um, but also about um, sort of the outlook. Um, and so um, that is that's driving people to leave, and um, absolutely absolutely a contributing factor. Um, I mean, a lot of a lot of aid has been has been provided. So, um, you know, it's a question about sort of how how well was it spent and and how was it how did it how was it done? How did it enable shoddy privatizations? Um, how did it enable um, you know the the, the mafia and uh, and the um, uh, ethnic elites to get them to get rich um, without without really building a long term economic perspective? Um, what can be done? Um, I still think that the United States. Um, has a, a very um, 
has a very potential um, proactive role, even though it has taken a, a sort of a step back and said the EU should take the lead for many years. Um, so um, I'm actually going to put a, a link in uh, to a good article, which um, I think is is making um, uh, by a Bosnian American um, is making a good case to say um, we do need actually political pressure to be put on the Biden administration because what they're doing is not at all in accordance either with U.S. principles, uh, you know, sort of democratic principles, um, nor nor the important role that the United States has played as a guarantor of of, uh, of the Dayton Agreement. So. Um, just to one, maybe one last note, um, NATO membership is complicated uh, in Bosnia. Um, it, it's often the, the first, considered the first step for EU membership. So there's a sense that we, you know, like there's a security agreement and then, um, you know, kind of economic and political integration happens. Um, but it, but it, is, it is controversial in Bosnia um, because um, uh, NATO was a, what NATO was an intervener and a, and a, and a bomber of the Serb forces. So. Um, I, th I think that that is important, but it needs to it needs to be done. Uh, in a, it has been done in a in a stepwise fashion. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put that link in a moment. In All right. I also want to ask you uh, to elaborate on the role of China in this region. Uh, China is active throughout the world, pursues a uh, a track that is totally uh, oppositional to how the U.S. conducts itself. Um, is, is China a, uh, uh, a, a, a beneficent uh, player in this region? What is exactly the role of China in, uh, uh, in, in the Balkans and particularly in Bosnia, Herzegovina? Uh, China has not played a very proactive diplomatic role. There's certainly economic ties um, and um, uh, there's some of the, um, uh, uh, but there's, there's not, not, even, not even a lot of the, um, you know, kind of loan, funded um, infrastructure projects and things that we see in other parts of the world. So hasn't hasn't been that proactive of an actor at this point. Okay, uh, Nick, will you read the questions that people are posting uh, uh, for for Andal or Belma or uh, Dr. Denisa? For sure. Um, <clears throat> Ms. Leslie just um, is asking, is Putin playing around again because he is ticked off about uh, including more countries in NATO? Our friend Ray McGovern keeps stressing uh, this, um, you know, about Putin. Um, Putin acts this way because we, the U.S., broke our promise about uh, not increasing NATO. Okay, I'll take, you could take one at a time. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, um, as a... Um, <coughs> I mean, I think that what's ha what's happening in Ukraine here absolutely merits uh, um, at the moment <laughs> merits merits close close following. Um, I I think that there's a there was a missed there was a missed opportunity. Um, that there was a point when when perhaps other kind of relationship with Russia was possible. At this point, it seems to be um, very antagonistic. So um, uh, I'm not um, uh, I'm not symp too sympathetic to the argument that. Um, if we take a step back from from Russia, that this will help make things better. Um, so um, uh, it's a, it, it, that's a, that's a complicated question. I, th I think there was a, there was an opportunity historically, and and um, I do think that uh, there is a, there is a sense of um, of insecurity in Russia uh, fostered by um, by a very active uh, and very close NATO presence, um, but. Um, how to how to get to to a more, to a secure Russia um, and at the same time um, uh, enable people in Ukraine, uh, which is uh, we've had numerous connections between Bosnia and Ukraine. Um, you, uh, Ukrainians don't need to pay the price um, uh, for for helping and, and for helping Russia feel more secure, and that's not that's not really going to help Russia feel more secure. So I think uh, Russia's role there in Ukraine and here in Bosnia. Uh, can can be a very can be a very destabilizing one, and I think that's part of how Russia sees its interest is um, that um, this Bosnia particularly is a place to cause trouble for the West um, because it's such a, it's viewed as such a Western project. So it's hard to see it's hard to see um, how to engage with Russia in a constructive way in 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 Bosnia. I think what. Um... Putin and China, especially when I was in Afghanistan, I really saw this. 
uh, instead of putting boots on the ground, it was chaos on the ground. And it was supplying weaponry to the Taliban, ISIS-K, whatever. Uh, China was about, you know, the economics. They built a highway one through Afghanistan. So what's happening in Kosovo now, um, the Eagle's Nest, does everybody know about that? I, I had a slide on it, but all these refugees now are going through Kosovo. And um, because they feel that they can go on the boat from it's Germany, right? Uh, however, Kosovo and that whole region in southern uh, Kosovo and what have you, uh, economically, is it's very poor. So it opens them up to China. And China is very good with no boots on the, ground, uh, on the ground, but to have economic things and to swoop right in and actually take over that way. Russia wants to have this refugee chaos all along the Balkan route. So does China, because they're waiting to go right in there. Same thing with the UAE. Uh, you've got the Middle East with the oil crisis because people are turning away. The United States decided that they're finally going to use solar and the electrical uh, ways of not oil and not be petroleum based. Um, so there's a lot of, like you had said, um, Randall, about the economic part of it. And if we really just sat down with the narratives of some of these refugees and, um, and looked at where are all these refugees coming, why all this chaos in Europe? It's the target. And it, yes, Putin's behind this, but China is more behind that. And there is um, there are other actors as well. And you've got the Serbian activists there, Vodek uh, uh, and uh, Vucic, uh, who are you know Serb nationalists, and they, uh, along with four years of uh, Trump, were you know really striving. They had a voice in the White House until recently, and. Uh, President Biden uh, has really been for the Dayton Accord and for Bosnia and to really put the money into uh, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, and so these Serb activists are not going to have such an easy time of getting away with things. They were very upset that Trump didn't get reelected. So you've got all these actors involved, and most people don't realize any of that. Thank you. Um, moving on to the next question. Oh, I'm sorry, were you done, Ms. Uh, Danica? Yeah, I'm done. Okay, cool. Um, so Ms. Lisa is asking, is there any possibility of the Dayton Agreement being revisited or revised? Um, uh, the way uh, it's sure. being I just want to mention, the way it's being revisited is by the CERB, um, uh, by these uh, Serb nationalists, and they're creating such um, conflict that people are weighing in and saying, this is a crisis. Um, and in fact, they're not even agreeing to a lot of the Dayton Accord right now. So um, powers that be around the Dayton Accord aren't saying anything. Not, there's no intervention. There's no word of it. So right now, they are how do I say getting away with fostering an environment like this? Maybe just just to add, I mean, um, I mean, the the Dayton Constitution can be can absolutely be amended, and there's been lots of talk over the years about a Dayton 2.0. Um, I think the the key problem is that um, the 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 Dayton Agreement and the Dayton Constitution um, created this idea that um, that there are um, ethnic that they're representatives of ethnic groups, um, right. Right? The, th the three members of the presidency, for example. And so by, um, uh, by creating this, uh, this idea, um, th uh, these, these people who, who have to approve something, right? I mean, you have to have some kind of majority of support or in the, um, in the way that Bosnians talk about it, so the, the constituent peoples, right? The three constituent peoples, the Bosniaks, the Croats, and the Serbs, Need to need to agree on something, and that just hasn't been possible. So, um, and and I don't I don't think that it's not going to be possible to get Dodik to agree to a, a more efficient state because that's right. not in his interest. Exactly my point. You know, they're just not going to go for it. The other thing is, is they do not want to have Bosnia Herzegovina 
a part of the EU. And the, that process for the EU, along with the changes to the Dayton Accord, um, what I mean by the powers that be, I'm talking about the allies, I'm talking about the US, I'm talking about Western Europe, um, all of those that you know could really help um, look at some more adaptations to the Dayton Accord, or at least see that this is starting to see there's these issues. And all the while this is going on, uh, Croatia's part of the EU, Serbia, I don't know if they are right now, now but they, they're pushing for it as well. But Bosnia, it's just um, on hold. So that also becomes uh, another element involved. So maybe just one, one last thing, um, back to the question about, you know, sort of, if you were contacting your congressman, what would you say? I mean, I think, I think there's really two two key messages um, is that um, I mean it's it's good to say it's in the U.S. interest to um, uh, to make Dayton work right because um, it's it's really viewed as a in many in many by many people and many citizens as a U.S. project um, so um, and yeah. and and the way to, and the way to do that is by by staying staying principles right so um, sticking sticking to democratic principles and civic principles and not and not engaging in a, a short-term deal with ethnic nationalists, um, exactly. which, will, um, which will only perpetuate what we've already seen and make it worse. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, can I ask you something, guys, also? Uh, you guys mentioning all the time, like uh, Russia, uh, Dodik, but how about uh, Chovic and the president of the Croatia too? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, I, I'm glad you brought that up because the Hatha, uh, the Democratic Croat, Croat um, leader, he is in on it with the Serb um, uh, national separatists as well. So they don't want to have uh, Bosnia Herzegovina uh, with the EU and they don't want the Dayton Accord adaptation either. They, they want actually more land or more economic. And they're much better off economically, Croatia. But yes, they don't. Um, everyone tends to avoid the um, the Croat Democratic uh, Party. There, um, that was a really good point. I'm glad you brought that up, uh, And 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 also Croatia. You mentioned Milanovic, the um, exactly, um, uh, exactly the, Cro the president of Croatia, right? Like. He's also also not playing a very unhelpful role. <laughs> Absolutely, oh, Cro not, Croatian nationalism not, very strong. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, he is now talking so many th stuff, bad stuff about the uh, genocide and about uh, us. I mean, and uh, Dragan Chovic starts to be the uh, uh, left hand of the Milorad Dodik. All together, the, they go to the uh, Russia, to the Putin, to talk about what what they're going to do with the Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh -huh. I mean, maybe just to just to say again a little bit of context. I think, um, I mean, part of the part of the challenge at the moment is that uh, with the with the 2013 census, the Bosniak population is now a majority of Bosnia, right? Which it wasn't before the war. Right. Um, and uh, Croats are the smallest group, um, and so this, um, in in some way, um, I think it's a it's a way of banding together in order to in order to prevent um, a, a, a direction of Bosnia which would be which would be more uh, more democratic and more more civic, uh, and would and which could could potentially enable um, Bosniaks to uh, kind of outvote other other groups. So, and I think there there are ways to there are ways to go about. Uh, protecting the rights of groups without um, without enabling these criminal <laughs> criminal leads. Yeah, they are criminals. I mean, and um, but nothing's really done. I mean, we're talking about it, but I don't see um, a response. I don't see a preventative response. I'll see an intervention after there's a war, or a crisis, or fighting breaking out, but I don't see it different this time. Are there more questions? Thank you for that. Um, just going on to the few comments that are in the in the chat real quick. Um, I believe the uh, Miss Leslie just mentioned Danica. Miss Danica just said that Putin is interfering with Bosnia as well. 
And so um, I also see that Putin is pushing. Oh, that was us ringing the standard. Just kidding. <laughs> I think that's it, right? So how do you press release for affirming data in court? I think she answered that. That was from his last. She, she answered yeah, she that. did actually. Yeah. I think we're done. <laughs> cool. Okay. Well, I'm just going to give uh, uh, our presenters, uh, you know, uh, one minute each uh, to summarize what they heard tonight from us. And um, uh, I'm particularly interested in, in taking some kind of action. Um, um, uh, there, there are so many things uh, that we have on our plate right now. And, and I speak as an ordinary uh, American. We are, we are dealing with, uh, uh, you know, a lot of has transpired since the mid nineties, right? We've had Iraq, we've had Afghanistan. Uh, right now we're dealing with, uh, uh, with COVID. We have threats to our own democracy here in the United States right now uh, that we are dealing with. So uh, 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 if you're an activist, uh, 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 you know, life, life is busy and life is, life is good, right? Because you, you know, there's plenty to do. Um, so um, if y'all could just boil down to, uh, something that I can speak to my fellow Americans, that given all these issues that we are dealing with, um, and, 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 and people in Europe uh, also, and, and people around the world, uh, uh, why is this particular issue uh, important? What is at stake? Hmm. Uh, which order? It's rhetorical, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but if you can take a stab at it, please. Well, I mean, um, yeah, sum summarizing, summarizing is, is, is gonna be really hard to do, but um, I think um, Bosnia is, is a place where, um, uh, where the, uh, a lot of the ideals that we have about, about democracy and, um, and also the, um, the potential for really overcoming um, a violent past um, and, and building peace, um, you know, absolutely exist here. So Bosnia, um, Bosnia needs support. Um, and that's, and I think that's, that's really, that's important and essential for the United States and what the United States should be and can be, can be in its best self in the world. It, ha it, the, it hits the, the rubber hits the road in Bosnia, from my point of view. I guess I, I would write to my representatives, um, Biden, and um, I'm going to repeat what I wrote to him in um, a couple of other councils about Bosnia and the growing, the growing third, um, separatism and uh, crisis. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask was, well, how hard would it be for the Biden administration to work to push back Dodik's dominance over the Bosnian state apparatus? What kind of response can I have from us as a US power or ally to provide safety, to have a preventative measure? What and how could the Biden administration orchestrate that? Uh, that I keep rewriting it over and over. And then how could the US really push for NATO membership for Bosnia to the European allies and then push Sarajevo over that finishing line to be, you know, uh, for the EU. I mean, that's still stuck. Why? It's While we have this crisis and all this hit, I mean, I can only summarize it in those two questions because I've been writing, I have been talking, um, I'm on the board with the Bosnian Genocide Institute. And Biden usually does an annual thing for years on a conference in Washington, D.C. He is very, very much an ally of the Bosnian issue. And I, I, he's very overloaded with the pandemic ending the Afghan war, which I'm so glad. But, you know, I still write those same two questions to all the council and congressional and committee members and Biden himself. I mean, half of my nonprofit and also with the Bosnian Genocide Institute. I mean, I, because this is like the same rhetoric that we had with Trump and, you know, the January 6th. I, I don't see it differently. I just see it all being orchestrated and played out again. 
Thank you. Thank you for that. Belma, you want to share some few words with us? Uh, what do what do I want to share? Also, uh, it is saying like uh, I think so. Bosnia will have a lot of problem uh, more if we still have those three presidents. If yes. we not have only one president at a time, like every country had it, uh, only one. We are the only one to have a three. And if we do not allow the Croatia and the Serbia put their hands in our country. Let deal us with each other. Don't uh, let them to be uh, somebody who's going to support only the Croatia and only Serbian people. No, no, we need to deal by ourselves. Right, right. And one more thing, why I was all the time asking, why did they give them the Republika Srpska? I really do, those, not only me, but in Bosnian people, they keep asking why, because they now can do whatever they want. Well, and they're doing that memorial for the war crime criminal who's dead, and they're just worshiping him, you know, this big memorial. And he was at the Hague and everything, and he was also a, a, a sort of nationalist separatist, so to speak, and it just, why did they let them go too? Uh, I mean, for example, Danica uh, and uh, uh, no, I mean, uh, uh, January 9, they are celebrating the Republic of Srpska, but they, we know what they did. They are one of people that they were like a genocide people. Yes. And they are celebrating the genocide. Yeah, every that memorial. Yep. Everybody are allowed to do that to them. Exactly. And it goes against the Daytona Agreement. It goes against the treaty, it could, and they, they still did it. And uh, Republika Srpska, it's not that that was the country. Bosnia is the, the Bosnia and Herzegovina was the one country who was exist. The Republika is only the like uh, part of the Bosnia. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. well, thank you everyone for uh, joining us. It's uh, getting late. Uh, I just want to finish with this last thought. Uh, first of all, thanking all our panelists, Belma and Dr. Randall and uh, Denise and Dr. Denise Anderson for participating uh, in this program, for educating us about a very, in my mind, a very, very critical issue. Uh, it is just absolutely unconscionable to me that there's any chance, not even a, 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 a slim chance or a just slight chance that we can go back to the atrocities, the, uh, the horrendous, the horrific episodes that transpired in the mid 1990s uh, in, 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 in Bosnia. Uh, so my takeaway is that if you are so inclined to call your representative, uh, and I hope many of us you on this call are in the habit of calling your representative because that's really, really important. Uh, if you're an activist, if you wanna bring about change to be in constant touch with your members of Congress, uh, their staffers and the Senator's office and tell them this simple, simple fact that Dr. Randall uh, articulated, we must uphold the Dayton Accords that the U.S. painstakingly uh, 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 was able to bring about uh, in 1996 uh, in Dayton, Ohio, that brought peace and stability. Although, you know, things have been festering and turmoil, but we had relative peace. Um, and then leave it up to the uh, people of the region uh, to work out uh, their differences and, and the way they want to govern themselves. But the U.S. and the uh, and NATO and EU, and I, I find myself, I surprise myself that I'm using these words because I'm against the uh, U.S. imperialism and the U.S. military adventurism around the world. That I catch myself saying these words that we have to play a role in this region to ensure peace, that that people can live in peace and stability, uh, and and not in fear. Uh, uh, of, of what happened uh, in, in the 1990s. So uh, please pick up the phone, call a member of Congress and just say that the Biden administration must do everything it can to uphold the peace accords that were signed in Dayton, Ohio, uh, almost 30 years ago to maintain peace and stability uh, in, in Bosnia, Herzegovina. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. And we will continue next month. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.